We have arrived at our fourth week and the final Sunday of our sermon series, Mountain Moving Prayer. I gotta tell you, it's been a huge personal blessing for me, not only to dig deeper into this aspect of prayer, but to also have um, uh, Renee Page also sharing insights as well. And I'm probably the biggest takeaway for me in this entire series is what we're we'll preaching about today is that why do we pray? I heard this over and over yesterday, uh, last uh, Friday night in the prayer workshop. Yes, we have needs, yes, we have supplications, yes, we have things we wanna go to the Lord, but the biggest reason we pray, the only reason we pray is for God's glory. Because we pray for God's glory, it changes our perspective, it changes our focus. That as I pray for God's glory and he answers my prayers, I can celebrate what he's doing in my life. But even if he doesn't answer the way I want him to answer them, I still can live for his glory. So we began the sermon series as we looked at how we pray from a position of surrender. That in that position of surrender, we can make bold requests and we can pray for personal transformation, but we're gonna do it all for God's glory. So to conclude this series, I want to take a closer look how we can and how we should end our prayers as we focus on God's glory, aligning our hearts, our lives to him. You see, we've been using the Lord's Prayer as a model and template for how we pray mountain moving prayers. Now, again, we've been talking not the basic prayers we pray, but these are, these, are the, these are the hard ones. These are the ones when we got a, a prodigal child, someone dying of, uh, of a terminal disease, uh, a broken marriage, a destroyed relationship, something a mountain in our lives. And so I wanna have you look at, the, at the, this, the, the theme and the, the, the setup of the Lord's Prayer. We begin in the Lord's Prayer from a position of surrender. And we start the prayer, our Father, we acknowledge who God is. Our Father, Abba Father, dear Daddy. And remember, when we talk about surrender, we're talking about saying to God, hey God, I, I'm gonna pray this for your glory, and I'm gonna accept your plan. I'm gonna submit to your control because I trust in your care as my Father. Which allows me to then keep his name holy in my life, that I can surrender my will to his will. And then I can acknowledge that God is in all things, above all things, and controls all things. And because I believe that God is all powerful and able to do more than I could ever ask or imagine, it gives me the opportunity to make a bold request of him. And so you see in that second part, it's not only praying for our daily needs, give us this day our daily bread, but it's also praying for personal transformation. That if you look at the next section, we pray, uh, we confess our sins. We ask God to forgive us our sins, that we would then forgive others. That we confess our doubts, our fears, the temptations we face in this world, and the evil all around us. But then we close this prayer, resting in God's grace, praying that regardless of the outcome, we are going to give glory to God. And in giving glory to God, we're gonna declare his good works and we're gonna share that good news with others that they too may join us in the Savior's eternal kingdom. So as you look at that, that diagram, I want you to see the Lord's Prayer starts the position of surrender and in that position of surrender, submitting to God for his glory, we make these requests. And we're praying for a personal transformation that we might be able to live out God's will and ways. And then the prayer ends is, for yours is the kingdom, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. So I want you to see something. Not only does this prayer start and finish with a focus on Almighty God rather than us, 
our needs, our requests are bookended or sandwiched between God's will and God's glory. So as we began this series, I want to remind you a couple things. What we believe about God's character will affect how we pray to him. You see, if we believe that God is this long distance, angry God who's somewhere out in the cosmos, who's just waiting for us to screw up so he can punish us, we're gonna pray, at, if we pray at all, it's gonna be in fear and guilt, not with boldness. But if we believe uh, God that he's all powerful and loving, who's our Abba Father, cares about every detail of our lives, it gives us the reality and, and permission to pray freely and frequently. And then what we believe about ourselves affects how we pray. If, if I believe that my sins can never be forgiven, why would I ask for forgiveness? I probably won't pray because I'm worried of fear, or guilt, or shame. Or, or if, if I believe I got it all figured out, and that, you know, I'm doing pretty good right now. I got this covered. God, you can go check on somebody else because we believe in a little small God. We don't think he handled all our requests at the same time. I might not pray to him because, you know what, I got it covered. But if I believe that I'm a beloved child of God, a child of God who needs his heavenly father, I want to pray freely and frequently. And what we believe about God's power and authority will also affect how we pray. That if we believe that God only performed miracles back in Bible times, why would we pray for a miracle today? Why would we pray for a, a miracle expecting any results? And if we don't believe that God is big enough or strong enough or powerful enough to fix my problem, I'm going to make timid and small requests. But if I believe I am praying to the creator of the universe, the one who sent the redeemer, the savior of the world into my life, into yours, the one who returned to heaven after he victoriously defeated sin, death, and the evil one, and gave us his spirit, I don't have to pray with fear or timidity. I can pray with confidence, because he is more than able. So if our needs and requests are sandwiched between God's will and God's glory, what does that look like? It's a great question. Turn in your Bible, so Luke chapter 22. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Luke's third gospel of the New Testament. We're going to be on page 882 if you're using the Bibles in front of you. Luke 22. And as you turn there, I want you to think about something. What is the most fervent prayer you have ever prayed? I mean, begging, on your knees, prostrate. Perhaps, perhaps it was at the bedside of a loved one who was dying. Maybe, maybe it was a 2 a.m. phone call and it was about your kid and they're six hours away, two days away, and they are in danger. And you are beside yourself and you are, cry, you are crying out. You're doing that Romans 8.26 that you're praying so hard, you don't even know how to express the words and the Spirit is interceding. Look at Luke chapter 22, verse 39. I want you to see a prayer that Jesus prayed that was a prayer of, of, of just earnest passion. Verse 39, again, this context, Jesus was with his disciples the night before he was crucified, 
and, and he had celebrated the Passover meal. He instituted the Lord's Supper. He had washed feet. He had taught him what it means to be a servant leader. He, he knew that Judas had already left to betray him. Peter was about to deny him. The disciples were going to desert him. He knew he was going to face a capture, a torture. He knew he was going to have these illegal trials. He knew he was going to be uh, crucified, abandoned by his father. Verse 39. And Jesus came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. So all that's going on in his mind, he knows it's about to happen. He just took place at the, Mount, uh, the, the, the Last Supper, verse 40. And when they came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. What a powerful statement that Jesus asked for his disciples. And not only that, Jesus is saying, I need you to pray for me, but I need you to pray for yourself because there's going to be some spiritual attacks going on here in just a few minutes. Jesus is under stress. He knows it's about to take place. He knows the extreme pain and suffering he and anguish he's about to endure. And look how he prays, verse 41. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Look what he said, Father, Abba Father, Dad, Daddy. Everything is possible for you. You're the creator of the universe. And if it's your will, you can take this cup from me. I know this is my entire reason I came to this earth. I know this is a mission to save the whole world. I'm not looking, around, I'm, I, I'm not looking forward to it. But if that's your will, may it be done in me. I want you to think about this. In this most fervent time of need, Jesus prayed, not to some abstract, divine, cosmic, whatever out there, or some long distance God, the big guy upstairs. He prayed to his father. He said, Father, I, I know that this is what my life and my ministry and my mission is all about. I know I'm about to endure your wrath and your punishment, that you're gonna forsake me because of the world's sin. And I, I, I know what lies ahead of me. I know the hell that I'm going to endure. And since everything is possible for you, I just wanna be sure. I, I want you, I want to know that you have me being abandoned, and this is what you want from me. Abba, Father, take this cup of suffering from me. You can do it. You can do it, if you so desire. So if you got another plan, we're getting close, so right now would probably be a good time to let me in on your plan. But then he does an even if. But Lord, even if taking this cup away from me is not your will, I want what you want in my life. I want your will to be done in me. Not what I think is best, but the will you have set before me. So again, look how Jesus does. His requests are sandwiched between God's will and God's glory. God, take this away from me. But even if that's not your plan, 
Give me the opportunity to glorify you. That was a complete act of surrendering, an act of obedience. In spite of what laid before Jesus, he prayed, Lord, your will be done. Against all temptation to walk away, Jesus is asking his Father to fill him with strength, with courage and peace to carry out his Father's plan. Because even if you want me to take this, I'm going to give you glory. I love what I was reminded yesterday by Renee in the prayer workshop about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, they told the king, the king said, you got to bow down before me. And they said, we will not worship anyone but the almighty God. And even if you throw us in the fire, we will still worship. We will still give glory to God. And Jesus prayed. Look at verse 43, how he was answered. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. Man, don't, don't, don't miss that verse. Verse 44, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. It's actually a physical condition that under extreme agony and distress, the blood would be coming from the pores. We can't fathom what Jesus endured that night. The three disciples have been set aside, but they gave her the temptation, and Jesus was alone. He prayed for something that we considered impossible. He prayed the cup would be taken from him, the cup of suffering, dying, and being forsaken by God. Was Jesus ignored? No way. The cup of suffering stays, and the Father's will prevails. And an angel from heaven appeared to Jesus to strengthen him. You see, in this prayer, Jesus overcame his own will and surrendered to the will of God to go to the cross, to save us from our sin, to defeat sin, death, and the power of the evil one, and to rise victoriously from the grave. Why? For the glory of God. Sandwiched between God's will and God's glory, we pray. And Jesus, in the Lord's Prayer, we say, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Now, if you look at this text, if you go back to the text of the Lord's Prayer, you won't see it unless you're using the King James Version or the NASB. But if you look at a footnote in the Bible's in front of you, there's a footnote in there that talks about some phrase that's actually a doxology. A doxology is a word of praise, a praise uttered that bursts from a soul that has caught sight of the awesome and majesty of God. It's an expression of truth about God's grace. And this is how we conclude the Lord's Prayer. We don't know if Jesus said these words, But as we teach, as this prayer is concluded in the Lord's Prayer, we are reminded that our God is our Father in heaven, whose name is holy, whose kingdom is coming, whose will is being done. Our Father who provides for our daily bread, who forgives our sins, provides strongholds for us from temptation, delivers us from the devil, we want to say thank you. So we tell Jesus, for yours is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever, amen. Where did it come from? It didn't come out of thin air. It was actually appeared the first hundred years of the church in the second century writing called the Didache, which means a teaching. And it was part of a liturgical response in the early church that as they would say these prayers, this response would be said. Additionally, this conclusion of the Lord's Prayer is found in later biblical manuscripts. 
But here's the deal. Regardless of Jesus said it or not, it's an incredible way to end an incredible prayer. A powerful expression of praise and certainty that God can do what we have prayed. So we pray with confidence and boldness, trusting that God not only hears us, but answers us. And even if his answer is different than we ask, He's still the power, the kingdom, and the glory, and it's our honor to serve him. This phrase actually comes from 1 Chronicles 29, verse 11. Hear these words. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and all the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, as you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. So if Jesus didn't say it, why do we preach it? Because we need to hear it. It's a mini statement of belief. Yours is the kingdom is a declaration of God's power, sovereignty, and authority over all things. Yours is the power is a declaration of ability. God can do this. He has power and dominion of all things. So I want to rest in him. Yours is the glory. It's a declaration of purpose. Invited to live for the glory of God that even if our prayers are not answered We will live for his glory so that his kingdom would come, so that his his world would be known among all of us. And then we say amen as a declaration of certainty. So shall it be, amen. I'm gonna invite the band forward. I want you to think about this. As we pray mountain moving prayers, What if we say, God, you're in charge of the kingdom. You have the power. And let me live the glory due your name. That you help me remember that every day of my life, and even if it doesn't happen in my time frame, I know it will in yours. And if not in this world, but in your kingdom to come. So help me to trust in you. Help me to rely on your strength. Calm my fears, crush my anxieties. Give me your peace. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.